The New Testament lesson is from Mark's Gospel, once again, Mark chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. I need to tell those of you who are following along that I read out of the NIV. I have 36 years worth of notes scribbled all over the pages of my NIV, and when I have tried to go to a different version, I'm just lost. So that's what I do, but follow along in Mark 1, 21 through 28. Let me, let me tell you this, David Losey, who's a preacher I know, says, don't you just dread exorcism stories? I mean, if there's one kind of biblical story we have a hard time relating to, it's got to be this one. Miracle stories are hard enough in our post-enlightenment scientific age, but at least we have experience longing for healing or, or we have a desire to feed those who, who are hungry. But demon possession, it's simply beyond the experience and the imagination of most of us. Listen to God's word. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit or perhaps your text says an unclean spirit, cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were also amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. And news about him spread quickly over the whole region. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We are so far in Mark's gospel that we can't easily do a recap. It opens this way, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The word beginning is wonderfully ambiguous here, obviously referring to the beginning of the book itself, but Mark's original audience was Jewish and were thus familiar with the first book of the Torah, Genesis, with its opening phrase in the beginning. William Plasher says that starting another book this way suggests a comparison between this story of a recently crucified rabbi and the story of God's creation of the whole universe which was the beginning of God's sacred word. In other words, history, creation itself, is beginning again. Now this new history cited by the prophet Isaiah, it describes John the Baptist and his ministry, and then by relating how Jesus came from Nazareth and was baptized by John in the Jordan, it sets the stage for our text this morning by juxtaposing it with the baptism of Jesus by John. As Jesus comes up out of the water, what happens? He sees heaven being torn apart. And out of this newly rent sky, the Spirit of God descends like a dove and a voice is heard from heaven. You are my son, whom I love with you I am well pleased. 
Yet here in what I have just read, verses 21 through 28, Mark relates the experience of Jesus with a man possessed by an evil spirit or an unclean spirit. It's a spirit that is most assuredly not telling him that he is beloved of God or God pleasing in any way. They are in Capernaum, the fishing village on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. You know, it was Northside Galilee. And on the Sabbath, Jesus went into the synagogue to teach. Now twice in this pericope, the word authority is used of Jesus. Early on, he taught them as one who had authority. And later the people say, what's this? A new teaching and with authority. The emphasis on this reminds me of that scene in Disney's The Lion King. You know, when Timon learns from Simba that he's a king. Timon says, let me get this straight. You're a king and you never told us? And Simba says, look, I'm still the same guy. To which Timon replies, but with power. You know, it's a new teaching, but with authority. And it's an authority that was immediately challenged. The text says, just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out. Now surely a man with an unclean spirit did not belong in a synagogue. He would have been ritually unclean. That was supposed to be sacred space. But the evil spirit cries out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. You know, it's interesting that evil spirits never seem to have any trouble identifying who Jesus is. But the good religious people of Jesus' day did. We don't like to think about evil much. In this day and age, we tend to say evil is such an old-fashioned idea. People aren't evil, they're, they're troubled. Or insensitive. Or selfish, or boorish. Or annoying. They just need to be educated. You know, there's good and bad in everyone. And we especially don't like to think about people with evil spirits in our synagogues and mosques and churches. After all, aren't congregations supposed to be where you go to get away from evil? Aren't they supposed to be full of good people? But here it is, 21 verses in the Mark's gospel, a person with an evil spirit. Granted, granted, Mark doesn't say an evil person. There's no getting around that. Mark doesn't say a person who was having a bad day either. He doesn't say a person who needed educated. He says, he says the man had an evil spirit. A synagogue, a congregation with evil right there. Michael White gave a lecture at Harvard a few years ago and and he said this, he said more than any other issue within the development of early Christianity and the Gospels tradition miracles present the most problematic area. In the modern so-called scientific world, the treatment of miracles has been a problem in a number of ways because what we do is we tend to explain away the miraculous in favor of more rationalistic explanations, many of which seem to be quite logical. But this has presented difficulties in dealing with the New Testament because the people of the ancient world literally seriously believe that miracles happen. And we have to put ourselves in their mindset of thinking about that and then look at how the stories are working with their belief at the forefront of the discussion and not start by simply saying miracles don't happen or exorcisms don't happen. 
We have to disengage our modern mind for a while and think with an ancient mind. We could probably boil down the first half or the first part of Mark's first chapter this way. Jesus has been introduced and baptized. He's been tempted in the wilderness. He's called his first disciples. And now he comes to proclaim and demonstrate the kingdom of God on earth. And he does this by opposing the forces of evil which would rob the children of God of all that God hopes and intends for them. Forces that curse rather than bless. That tear down rather than build up. That disparage rather than encourage. That hate rather than love. There are many, many, many demons in this world. Consider this text carefully. Carefully. Notice that the man with the evil spirit is not objecting to any specific teaching of Jesus. This isn't about a doctrinal dispute. There is nothing about blasphemy here. It's simply his presence. It is the fact that Jesus is there that is threatening. Light, purely by being light, casts out darkness. So the demon is cast out. That Jesus was an exorcist, all the Gospels except John agree. And for Mark, it was centrally important to his portrayal of Jesus. Not because exorcising demons made Jesus unique. By the way, there were other exorcists noted in the New Testament. Nor was his method of exorcism different from the usual pattern. Accounts of exorcisms usually began with the demon's recognition of the exorcist, with the command to come out of the one possessed, with loud and demonstrative departures of the demons and the amazement of the spectators. It was good theater, and whether you find them in the New Testament or in extra-biblical literature, they all follow this pattern. What is striking in this text is the setting of the story of expelling an unclean spirit is in the context of his teaching. The exorcism is to illustrate the power of Jesus' teaching. I mean, what did the people say? A new teaching, but with authority. He even gives orders to evil spirits, and they obey him. Two final comments. First of all, there, there may be profound reasons that evil is couched in terms of possession. When people are captivated by someone or something other than God, that's when literally all hell breaks loose. And let's be honest. Even when one claims to be acting on God's behalf, that doesn't necessarily mean it's true. Synagogues, mosques, churches, all kinds of communities, even entire peoples and nations can be possessed by demonic ideologies and dogmas. Think of the Nazis or Pol Pot or Bosnia or Rwanda. And think about people that we know and love and care about who are possessed by by hatred or by, by jealousy. What possesses us might be a question to keep us up late at night. And secondly, even though we've come to see that the exorcism in this text functions to illustrate the power of Jesus' teaching, Let's not forget that the man was healed, that he was liberated, that his demonic possession was ended. 
all the forces that bind us, that constrict us, that fetter us, that keep us from being the kind of people we want to be, that prevent us from following our better inclinations are not limitless in their power. Bob Stolman was teaching a psychology class at a junior college. He needed a subject to demonstrate Pavlov's stimulus response. Y'all remember that from high school and college psychology. It's kind of a complicated story, but finally a Vietnam veteran offered himself as an example. Bob asked him for a word that he thought would have meaning for him. And the idea behind this experiment is for the class to chant this word and for the person being experimented on to kind of empty themselves and to take on the word that is being chanted, to become possessed by the word that's being chanted. Well, he was a Vietnam vet. He chose the word kill. Nervous, <laughs> Bob asked the class to slowly repeat the word kill. 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 Well, as this experiment unfolded, the soldier began to respond with something out of post traumatic stress syndrome. He made movements as though he were hitting someone on the ground with a with the butt of his rifle or perhaps even a bayonet. And he became more agitated and more violent and Stolman thought to himself, this young man must be completely consumed with memories of killing. And the only thing he could think to do to stop the cycle of his reaction was to reach out and to put his arms around him and hug him into stopping those movements. In front of the class, both of them wept. At his baptism, Jesus heard a voice from heaven saying, You are my son whom I love. With you I am pleased. The man with the unclean spirit did not and probably never did hear those words. My friends, if nothing else ever gets said here at Northside, let it be this. You are God's son. You are God's daughter. With you he is pleased. Let us pray together. Oh God, we know the power of words is dramatic. And we have all heard words that have hurt, that have belittled, that have damaged. May we learn to speak words of health and wholeness and healing to each other. May we hear your words of love and redemption. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.